Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Downey and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's AWRI webinar. Today's session will focus in on factors influencing the formation of volatile sulfur compounds and the effectiveness of four commonly used remediation strategies. And joining me to discuss uh, the topic is Dr. Marlies Becker, a senior research scientist here at the AWRI. With a PhD from Stellenbosch University, Marlies joined the AWRI in 2011 and her research interests have focused in on the formation and fate of undesirable sulfur compounds in wine. But before I jump over to Marlies, a quick note for those in the audience, to provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. And just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view uh, later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. All registrants will receive a link to view the recording after the session. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. Now, for those of you just joining us, welcome. Today's topic is the formation and remediation of stinky sulfur aromas in wines. And I'll hand over now to our speaker, Dr. Marlies Becker, to start the conversation. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. And it's really good to know that this topic is of interest to the wine industry. So thank you so much for logging on today. So this webinar today will be focusing on two aspects and two research projects. So the first part, will be on the post-bottling formation of stinky sulfur aromas in wines, and we'll specifically look at the role that precursor compounds play in the formation of these reductive aromas. And the second part of the um, webinar will be focused on remediation strategies. So the first part has been published, and you'll see the link to the paper at the bottom of the appropriate slides. And you can contact our library, who would kindly um, forward you the um, paper if you're interested. And regarding the remediation trial, so this is a very fresh and we are only now starting to draw to a close with this project. And in August, we'll do a big sensory trial on these um, wines. So um, the wines will also be showcased in the 2019 AWITC. And I welcome all of you to come and sign up for the workshop and come and try these wines for yourself if you're interested to see how effective these different remediation strategies were that we employed for these wines. So I'm sure that everybody who's listening today is actually quite familiar with reductive aroma compounds in wine, but I thought I'd just give a quick um, recap on some of the main culprits. So when we see reductive aroma compounds in wine, we usually look at hydrogen sulfide, methanethyl and ethanethyl, and they impart aromas of boiled and rotten eggs, rotten cabbage and sewage, as well as onion and fecal aroma, so really unpleasant. And what makes them so important is that they impart um, the negative aromas when present in very low concentrations. So when present at about one microgram per liter, they can have a negative effect on your wines. Some of the other compounds that are of interest is dimethyl sulfide. So this also imparts negative aromas when present at very high concentrations. But when it's present in uh, lower concentrations, um, it can actually impart positive aromas like um, black currant and even truffle. So the other compounds we're also interested in is the thioacetates and disulfides. So these compounds not only impart negative aromas of cheesy, garlicky, cabbage and onion, but they also can act as precursors to some of these smaller molecules. And these are the ones that we're also interested in today. So where do these compounds come from? So we all know that the main source of uh, volatile sulfur compounds um, are the yeast metabolism. So they're produced early during fermentation. And that's why it's so important to choose the correct yeast so that you don't um, end up with reductive characters later on. But once you've got your wine finished and your wine is in bottle, then the formation of these compounds are mainly um, determined by the concentration of precursors in your wine. So this could be any compound that's got a sulfur moiety at the back that can be um, released through chemical switches or chemical drivers to produce hydrogen sulfide or methanethyl, for example. 
So if we have a look at the possible chemical switches and chemical drivers, we can look at low oxygen conditions. So this can either be doing winemaking that can affect and um, determine the evolution of these compounds later on post bottling, as well as low oxygen conditions during bottle storage. Another important factor is um, the amount of residual metals that are present in our wines, because we know that metals such as um, copper, iron, aluminium, and zinc can act as catalysts and, chemical, and as chemical switches to release these sulfur moieties from the precursor compounds. So it's really a balance of these three factors, what is produced during fermentation, the precursors present in your wine, and then also the chemical switches in your wine that will determine whether your wine goes reductive or not. So if we have a look at the precursors to hydrogen sulfide, we know that the compound is pretty well defined during fermentation. So we know cysteine and glutathione can act as precursors to H2S during fermentation through the sulfur assimilation pathway. But during post-bottling, people have suggested that these compounds can also act as precursors to H2S. So previously, none of the studies have been done in wine, and the majority of the studies was done in water or model matrices. So we decided to develop or to design an experiment where we looked at a Vidao and a Shiraz wine, and we added cysteine and glutathione at relatively high concentrations. So they're at mid to average values or mid to high values for cysteine and glutathione in wine. And then we also added copper as a variable because we know that copper can act as a chemical trigger and that can um, be involved in the release of H2S. We evaluated these wines over a 12 month period and these wines were also prepared and stored under nitrogen to completely exclude any impacts of oxygen on the formation of H2S. So the scheme here at the top um, shows the chemical pathways that we were interested in. So we were interested in whether H2S can be um, formed from cysteine, either, in the pre either by itself or as driven by copper. And similarly, if glutathione can release H2S, either alone or um, driven by copper. So if we look at our control wines, so this is the wines without any treatment, followed over a 12 month period for the Vidao and the Shiraz. You can see that for both of these wines, um, there wasn't a lot of H2S formation. It remained relatively constant and quite low throughout the wines for, for the 12 months of the bottle storage. And when we added cysteine and glutathione, showed by the red trace and the green trace, you can see specifically in the video that no, there was no extra H2S produced as a function of cysteine or glutathione treatment. In the Shiraz wine, cysteine also didn't release a lot of H2S, um, nothing significant but glutathione was associated with a small increase in H2S. So it does appear that cysteine and glutathione by the self do not promote H2S formation, especially considering the amount of glutathione and cysteine we added to the wines. When we then added copper to the wines, just by themselves, not with any precursors, you could see that there was quite a, a lot of H2S being produced, especially in the red wines. So copper was acting on some unknown precursors that we, weren't, that we haven't yet identified in the wine that was forming this H2S compound. And then interestingly, when we added the combined cysteine and copper to the wine, you can see that for the white wines, there wasn't a dramatic increase. So there wasn't any more H2S being produced from the combined cysteine and copper, more than what was produced by copper by itself. And in the Shiraz, we actually saw a little bit less um, H2S being produced than what was produced when we added copper to the wine. But the most interesting thing was when we added glutathione and copper in combination. So immediately this big spike in H2S formation in the Verdeo stands out. And if we have a look at the Shiraz, we can see there was definitely a slight increase, but not as dramatic as in the white wine. So this is quite important because you will remember that when we added the glutathione by itself, we didn't see any formation, but the combined treatment of glutathione and copper seems to be quite a risk for H2S production. So where we can't really control our glutathione concentrations in our wine, unless you're adding glutathione as an antioxidant or whether you're adding yeast nutrients, 
you can in fact control your copper concentration. So just by keeping your copper, your residual copper concentrations low in your wine, do you um, decrease the risk of H2S formation? So if we move on to methanethyl, once again, the formation of methanethyl during fermentation is pretty well known, um, with the main precursor being methionine. And post-bottling, once again, these two compounds have been suggested as the main source of methanethyl post-bottling, so the methyl thioacetate and dimethyl disulfide. But again, these precursors have never been evaluated in real wines. They've only been evaluated in model systems and in water. So we designed um, two experiments and in the first one we added dimethyl disulfide and methyl thioacetate to the wines at 50 micrograms per litre and again we added copper as a variable because we know that it can act as a chemical trigger. Again, we uh, prepared and stored the wines under nitrogen to remove the oxygen, effect of oxygen on methanethyl production, and we evaluated these wines over 12 months. But because we know that thioacetates specifically are um, prone to acid hydrolysis, we did designed a second experiment where we evaluated the pH effects. So we um, took two wines, a Shiraz and a Chardonnay, and we kept their um, initial pH unadjusted, so 3.72 for the red and 3.46 for the white, but then we also dropped the pH to 3, just to see what the effect of that decrease of pH would be on methanethyl production from the thioacetates. Again, these wines were evaluated over 12 months and they were stored under nitrogen and were also prepared under nitrogen. So this is the chemical pathways that we were interested in whether the thioacetate would release methanethyl with or without copper and whether the disulfide would release methanethyl with or without copper. So if we again look at our control wines and just the natural evolution of methanethyl over the course of 12 months in the white and in the red wine, you can see that there was a quite, not a large amount, but there was some methanethyl produced over the course of 12 months. And in the red wine, we actually saw a little bit of a decrease. For these wines, when we introduced copper, we didn't see a dramatic increase in methanethyl concentration. So the trace is nearly exactly the same. So for these specific wines, it appears that copper did not act on unknown precursors to produce methanethyl. But when we added the thioacetate, we immediately saw an increase in methanethyl production, a little bit more so in the white wine than in the red wine. Um, and this is to do mostly with uh, accumulation effect, that the matrices are quite different, and this is discussed in this paper below. Um, when we added copper, the copper and the thioacetate, once again, we didn't see any difference between the amount of methanethyl being produced, um, either in the red or in the white. So this shows that copper did not act as a chemical trigger that promoted the release from methanethyl from the thioacetate. When we added the disulfide to the wine, you can again see this dramatic increase in the methanethyl production, more so in the white again than in the red. And the combination of dimethyl disulfide with copper produced even more um, methanethyl. So this is quite important again, because if you have evaluated your wines, either through a, a bench trial um, testing, a aroma test, or through chemical analyses, and you do see some disulfides in your wine, it would be highly recommended to not add um, copper to your wines because you'll see this dramatic increase in methylthion production. So to move on to the second experiment where we were interested in the pH effects, you can see um, that in our Chardonnay and our Shiraz wines, again, we saw um, the natural evolution pattern of methanethyl in the control wines with the unadjusted pHs. And then when we dropped the pH to three in these wines, we didn't see a dramatic increase in methanethyl. The traces look basically exactly the same. So just by lowering the pH of a wine without any precursors, you don't promote methanethyl production. But then when we added the thioacetate to the wines, not adjusting the pH, we saw this increase in, the, in methanethyl production, as we were expecting from the previous experiment, and a little bit less so in the red wine. Again, that accumulation effect. Um, 
But very interestingly, as we dropped the pH, we did see that big increase in methanthal production from the thiol acetate. So this is also something to keep in mind that if you have done your evaluation of your wine and you know that there are thiol acetates present, to be very careful of your pH management of your wine. So our take home messages for the volatile sulfur com compound formation from the precursors can be summarized as follows. So cysteine and glutathione alone do not pose a very big risk for H2S formation post bottling. It's only when they're in combination with copper that we really start to um, develop some risks for the formation. And luckily for us, that is something that is easily managed by just not adding copper, uh, or if you add your copper, add it earlier to your wines. If we look at the methanthyl precursors, we can say that both those disulfides and the thiol acetates are important precursors to methanthyl. And when we looked at the stoichio stoichiochemical um, balance between the moles of DMDS added and the moles of methanthal produced, we saw that we produced up to a 70% yield of methanthal from the DMDS over 12 months in the specific wines. So it really poses quite a significant risk and especially that was in combination with copper again. And the methanthal acetate, we produced up to a 30% uh, yield of methanthal over the course of the experiment. So what does this mean for the wine industry? Again, um, very important to select the right yeast for your wines. A wine that is a low a thiol acetate producer that you don't end up with high concentrations of methanthyl or even ethanthyl later in your wine. And then to also be very um, conscious of the impacts of copper in your wine that um, some winemakers use it as a prophylactic treatment just before bottling, but that can have quite a detrimental effect to just add it for just in case, because you can see the impact that copper has on the precursor compounds. And then if you do have a wine that you um, measure methanthyl acetate or disulfides in the wine, then it might be a good idea to reevaluate the release date, maybe bring it a little bit forward and not um, put that wine on the market to be um, bottled and stored and drunk at a later stage. So this brings us to the second part of um, the webinar, where we're going to look at some remediation strategies, because what do you do once you actually have reductive characters in your wines? So we do actually have a couple of options available for us. And the first option is DAP addition. And this is our first point of call. If we have um, ferments with low yan, we increase our DAP. And this is very effective because we all know a stressed yeast and a yeast that doesn't have enough nutrients are prone to use the amino acids and to produce a lot of stinky sulfur compounds. So if that doesn't work, then you have the option of using oxygen treatment. So there's a couple of um, possibilities. You can either do very aerative racking or oxidative um, splashing and pump overs. You can also make use of a micro oxygenation a process where a very controlled amount of oxygen is introduced into the wine. Um, 0.5 to 10 mils of air per minute um, or oh, sorry per litre per month for the wine so it's a very small amount and then you could also use um, macro oxygenation so this is um, where quite a lot of um, oxygen is introduced in the wine usually the safest part for macro ox is doing active ferment where the yeast can utilize the oxygen and you aim to reach a saturation in your wines. You don't always achieve it, but um, that's what you aim for. Um, you can also use copper fining. So the best time to use your copper fining is early when you have some active lees available in your wine that can bind the residual copper. So the copper can strip the thiols, then bind to the lees and then you can remove the lees. Um, but you can also use copper later when there's no active lees available, but then you do have the risk of increasing your residual copper concentrations. And then some winemakers also make use of a lees donor, and this is where you take um, lees produced from a clean wine, a different wine, and you add it to your um, stinky ferment, and that also binds some of the reductive characters and remove them from your wines. So um, now I'm gonna show you um, just a little bit more information about the 2017 remediation experiment. 
So in this experiment, we specifically wanted to compare how effective the different remediation strategies are. Um, and like I said, this is just a sneak peek. Um, the project will be completed in August and the wines will be ready for tasting um, at the AWITC. So we specifically wanted to produce a very reductive wine. So we went out and we picked fruit that we know had a low yan. And then we made the fruit, oh, we made the wines uh, quite reductively. So we excluded oxygen through each part of the pump over and in and, and, and every process. And then we also used a yeast that we know can um, produce a lot of reductive aroma compounds. So we produced a very stinky wine and this was our control wine. So then the first point of call um, that we tried to remediate the wine was through DAP addition. So we added um, 200 parts of DAP three days post inoculation and again 150 parts five days post inoculation. So the second treatment that we utilized was copper addition. So we aim to use copper early while there was still some active uh, yeast available. So we added our copper after pressing, but while the sugars were still at one barme, and we determined the amount of copper to add through a bench trial. So the second, the third treatment um, that we employed was um, macro oxygenation. So we started our treatment when 20% of the initial sugars were consumed and we um, sparged the wines with 1.5 liters of air per minute for two hours for four consecutive days. The fourth treatment was a combination of our macro ox and our copper treatments. So we employed the same oxygenation treatment and the same copper addition treatment, again, determined by a bench trial. But because the macro oxygenation treatment was so effective, we ended up using a lot less copper in this treatment that we did use, um, that we needed to use for um, those sets of wines. So all of these wines were um, prepared in triplicate. So we've got three sets for each separate treatment. And then we also had um, one set of wines that were treated with a donor lees. So we prepared a wine um, with a completely different lees and we used, there was no oxygen exclusion for this wine. And we added the donor lees to the stinky wines after malolactic fermentation. So let's see what the effects was on some of our reductive aroma compounds. So initially, directly post bottling, you can see our hydrogen sulfide concentration here. And we have our control wines, copper treated, oxygen treatment, copper and oxygen, and then our DAP treatment and our lees. So initially it appears that our DAP treatment and our lease treatment wasn't as effective, whereas the copper, the oxygen, and the combined copper and oxygen were the most effective in remediating hydrogen sulfide. But then when we reevaluated the wine six months post bottling, when the wine has settled a bit, you can see that all the treatments were quite successful with um, the oxygen, the copper oxygen, the DAP, and the lease being the most effective. So it's interesting that the copper wasn't the most effective treatment. And this is actually quite a good thing because if you have all these other remediation tools available for use that you can um, employ that is successful in removing hydrogen sulfide, it would be recommended to prefer to use them rather than copper just because that we know that copper can have detrimental effects later in the wine's life. If we look at methane thiol, Initially, it appeared that um, our DAP and our lease treatment actually increased methanthal compared to our control samples. And again, that the copper, the oxygen, and that the copper and oxygen treatments were the most effective in remediating methanthal. But a very interesting thing happened a few months post bottling, six months post bottling. And here it appears that the methanthal concentration is actually quite similar for all the treatments. And this is something that we hear from industry a lot. And that is that um, a compound such as methanthal is actually quite hard to remediate. So it is possible that initially the effects that we saw, the decrease in methanthal, was um, the oxidation of methanthal into larger molecular weight compounds. And that this oxidized compound then later during storage was reduced. And then that the methanthal concentrations reset to its original values. Um, unlike hydrogen sulfide, where, other, where it's more easily remediated. So just out of interest, we can have a quick look at the dimethyl sulfide concentrations. 
So it wasn't initially impacted by um, any other remediation strategies and we weren't really expecting it to be impacted. And that um, line over there is the aroma threshold. And if you look post bottling, um, you can see that the majority of the concentration of the dimethyl sulfide in all the wines are very similar with um, DAP and Lees slightly lower than some of the other wines. So this is also quite interesting, um, the effects that DAP can have in modulating dimethyl sulfide concentrations. If we look at the methyl fire acetate, the compound that we know can act as a quite a significant precursor to methanthyl, you can see that the copper and the copper and oxygen treatment, as well as the least treatment, were the most effective in remediating methanthyl or modulating its formation during ferment, just um, as measured post bottling. And then six months later, our three treatments are copper, oxygen, and copper and oxygen were still the most effective in producing the lowest methanthyl concentrations. So our take home messages for our remediation trial after six months of bottle storage for H2S is that all treatments were successful. Some were a little bit more su um, successful than others, but it's interesting that the copper wasn't the most effective and that if you can use the alternative remediation treatment rather than copper, it is definitely preferred as you can reduce the risk of developing reductive characters post bottling. If we look at the remediation of methanthyl, we saw that the oxygen treatments appeared to be the most effective immediately post bottling, but after six months, there was no big differences between the treatments, which suggests that this compound might, had, might have been initially oxidized to something larger that removed it temporarily from the wine, but that it reappeared later. Um, the dimethyl sulfide formation was impacted by DAP and Lees, um, which points to um, Lees activity or yeast activity. And the methanthyl acetate evolution was impacted the most by copper and oxygen treatments. So if your um, oxygen treatments were effective in uh, remediating the thyroid acetates, as well as methanthyl and hydrogen sulfide, that might be one to consider for your wines. So again, um, these wines will be available for tasting. So if you want to make your own opinion on what, your, what you think is the most effective remediation strategy, um, come and evaluate them for your, the, yourself. So I would just like to acknowledge the following people from the AWRI because it's really a cast of thousands um, who contribute to the work and especially Paul, Ali, Anais, Eric, Martin um, for all their help and contribution. And then I also would like to thank the Australian grape growers and winemakers who invest um, into the research through their um, investment body, Wine Australia. And then also thank you for your kind attention. Um, are there any questions? Thank you for going through your presentation there, Marley. It's very interesting. Um, as Marley has indicated, we'll now move into a QA. and a So if you do have any questions for Marley, she will stick around for a little while. So a reminder for anyone that hasn't uh, done a webinar previously to ask a question, just open the Q&A part of the uh, control panel and type your questions in and we'll um, read them aloud. We don't have any questions just yet, Marlies. I might just uh, re-emphasise what Marlies mentioned at the start of the presentation. If you would like to get hold of any of the publications that were mentioned on her slides, uh, please do contact the AWRI library and uh, we'll happily supply those publications. Um, yeah, you can contact the library at infoservices at awri.com.au. Okay, so we've got our first question here, Marlies. Um, any strategies on avoiding sulfides during fermentation? This tends to be a big problem for me. Um, hi, Peter. So I think the thing that we found um, to be the most effective was using a lot of oxygen during fermentation. So we've been doing a couple of trials I think since 2012 in red ferments and in white ferments where we use this micro oxygenation technique. Um, so sparging the wines with a large amount of oxygen during active fermentation. 
and um, this has been extremely effective. So this doesn't only remove the um, stinky sulfurs early during fermentation, but it also has long lasting effects. So when we published this work, um, the wines were in bottle for 16 months and the positive effects we saw from oxygen treatment early during fermentation carried over all the way through to um, 16 months post bottling. And very importantly, we didn't see any oxidative characters because that's the thing that people are the most concerned about. So we've got uh, two publications out on this work. Um, you can just chat with Michael um, to the diff one is published on 20, 20 16, I think. Yeah, but Michael will know and he'll be able to forward that um, information on to you if you're interested. Yeah, thanks for your question there, Peter. As Marlies has already said, yeah, please contact the library if you want to get hold of that publication. Um, another question here, what is the reductive compound causing the matchstick or flint aroma so popular in modern Chardonnays? So um, that uh, match stick or flint aroma is caused by um, benzomycaptan. So there's quite a lot of um, interest in this compound because it's um, many people don't like it, but um, many winemakers will tell you that it's actually quite a wanted compound and a wanted characteristic in the wine. So people are still trying to understand um, what conditions can promote the matchstick or flint aroma. Um, but yeah, as far as our knowledge, um, it is the benzomycaptan. There's also another French study that pointed to possible other sulfur compounds that could also contribute, um, a longer chain uh, polysulfane, but um, that still needs to be proved. Okay, so just a quick follow-up to that question then sounds like you've already answered it. Um, is this truly a wine fault? Um, so in my opinion, no. For me, it's a stylistic. Um, it's, it's a wine style. Some people don't prefer the wine style. Um, and usually it's uh, present in such small concentrations that it's not overwhelming. So yeah, I don't think it's a fault. Okay, thank you, Malise. Uh, another question here, what type of closure was used for the experiment? So because we were interested um, in the um, reductive characters or to, to exclude any oxygen effect, we did use screw caps where we know that we have very little um, ingress of oxygen um, into our wines. So then we can be sure that any effect that we're seeing is solely um, related to the treatments that we did and not due to um, a closure effect. Okay, thanks Marlies. Um, I've got another question. I might get Marlies to read this one aloud. Um, so we've got a question here on how would a winery go about differentiating methanthal from hydrogen sulfide during fermentation to avoid the risk of using copper and increasing the formation of HTS post bottling. So um, these two compounds have quite different um, aroma characters. So when we see um, methanthal in a wine, it's really a rotten cabbage type of aroma whereas H2S is more a sewage and a fecal aroma, a rotten egg. So um, H2S is also easily, a, it, it blows off a lot easier. So if you swirl your wine, you can um, get rid of H2S a lot easier than methanthyl. So that's just um, if you do your, um, just an aroma test. Then there's also um, commercial gas tubes available. It's um, lead acetate tubes that they use to measure um, environmental gases. So this is not very expensive. And these, these tubes um, react specifically with specific um, sulfur compounds. So you can buy them to determine whether you have H2S or methanthyl um, by monitoring the headspace of your ferment. Um, you can also send wines off for analyses, and I think this will, other than the lead acetate tubes, um, this will be the most accurate way of determining which one you have. Okay. 
Okay, another question. Coming back to the Benzema captain reduction formation, how can it be monitored and avoided during fermentation? So unfortunately, um, to answer the second part first, how to be avoided during fermentation, as far as I know, there's not a lot of research, firstly, on um, where it's uh, where the formation of this compound form, uh, happens initially. So I think we still need to do a lot of work to determine which factors promote its formation. And then if we know where it's being formed, how to um, prevent it, if that's what you want to do. Monitoring benzomacaptan um, that you can do through a variety of, it'll have to be specialized um, analysis methods. So you can do GCMS analysis of the compound or um, LCMS methods. So at the AWRI, we've got two methods up and running that you can, if you want to send your wines through, that we can analyze them for you if you'd like. Okay, another question. Does SO2 addition make matters worse? Yeah, so this is quite a complex question. So we've had a look at some previous and previous studies at the role of SO2 and the interaction between SO2 and copper. And it does appear that in certain wines, SO2 can be problematic, not necessarily from the direct formation of H2S from SO2, but more the interaction of SO2 with other wine compounds. So SO2 can maybe react with um, quinones, compounds that would normally scalp your H2S. And if it rather reacts with SO2 because it's present in a higher concentration, then that leaves the H2S free to increase. So SO2 can also act as a reducing agent and it might have an impact on some other molecules and other larger compounds. But there's not a lot of work out there. We've only got that one published study where we looked at SO2 and copper. And for those wines, it did appear that in that specific case that it did make a difference and a negative one. Okay, thank you to the audience for all those questions and also to Marlies for uh, providing some comments and answers to those questions. Uh, it looks like that was our final question. So we might start to wrap up. Um, before we do so, Marlies, did you want to make any final comments or say anything? No, no problem. Yeah, we have had just one final comment saying uh, thanks for the answers and info about the lead acetate tubes great webinar we'll certainly check out the research thanks very much so thank you for your feedback there um, so i'd like to first thank um, and extend a, a big thank you to marlies for providing the content for this informative session and i'd also like to thank you the audience for um, participating attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording um, that was the final uh, scheduled webinar for the 2017-18 program. We are in the uh, early stages of developing the program for next year's content. So please um, stay tuned for more on that. Thank you again for joining the session and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.